Hi everyone, and welcome to Exploring the Build. If you've just found this place, then welcome. And if you're returning, I'm glad to have you back. I'm Alex, and this is my channel where we explore and theorycraft different character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Today, we are continuing along with our Frosthaven series of character builds, where we're going to be trying to create the character classes from the board game Frosthaven and recreate them in Dungeons & Dragons. Since Frosthaven is a newer game compared to the rest of the Gloomhaven series, this is the major spoiler warning for this video. We are done our starting character classes and we are now onto the locked character classes that are in the Frosthaven board game. If you at all plan on playing Frosthaven, if you are playing Frosthaven but don't have this class unlocked, or if you just don't want spoilers for any other reason for the character class, then do not watch this video. I won't take any offense. You can always come back and watch it at a later time. If you don't care about spoilers though, or you already know what the character class is, or you just want to see how this character build works in Dungeons and Dragons, then feel free to continue watching. I'll pause now, but consider this your last spoiler warning. All right. Now let's jump into the build. Today we are looking at making the first of our locked character classes from the Frosthaven game, and that is the Algox Frozen Fist. First things first, Frosthaven character classes are unlocked through story progression, as opposed to Gloomhaven where they were unlocked through retiring your character. You would create a character, have a personal goal, when you completed that, you would retire and you would automatically get a new character class. Since Frosthaven is different and it's all story based, that means that character classes tend to get unlocked in pairs. There's generally two per storyline, plus there's a few others you can find out and about in the world of Frosthaven. Frozen Fist is our first video because it is one of the first two character classes that you sort of learn about in the board game. And admittedly, it was the first character class that my group unlocked, so I'm a little biased towards it. Now, in terms of what makes the Frozen Fist unique in Frosthaven, they are a big, beefy warrior for starters. They quite literally have the largest miniature out of every character class in the entire Haven series. Beyond that, they do actually have lots of tanking potential to back up their big size. Depending on the build you'd go with, you will have either lots of shields and retaliates, allowing you to reduce damage and deal damage back to enemies whenever you get hit, or you'll have plenty of control and on your turn damage through attacks and other various features. The Frozen Fist can be built in different ways, and there's two main ways in particular that you could select their abilities to build for. Each one of these builds focuses on a different playstyle and a different element. There is ice for damage, and there is earth for tanking. The last thing to note is the Frozen Fist's unique mechanic. They have a hand size of eight, which translates to low stamina, more or less. You can see our Spell Weaver to get a rundown on how the hand size in Gloomhaven affects the stamina of the character, and why we might want to account for that in D&D. However, they can mitigate this hand size with a specific card, One with the Mountain. One with the Mountain allows them to permanently be able to recover cards at the end of their turn, at the cost of some health, and they also have permanent regenerate, which means that they just constantly regain one hit point at the start of their turn. Yes, they are basically Wolverine, if Wolverine was a fantasy race character instead of just a superhero. The elements and different play styles are pretty straightforward to be able to get in Dungeons and Dragons, but that permanent health regen is going to be a little bit trickier. When looking at how we're going to go about creating this character in D&D, we're going to need quite a few features in order to give us the exact flavor that we're looking for in the Frozen Fist. Before we start the build though, let's look at their flavor text. Algox are at home in the north. Their thick white fur offers great protection from the elements, and their strength and intelligence put them at the top of the food chain. They are imposing figures with three spiling horns atop their head. This feature they share with their distant relatives, the Inox. Like their cousins, the Algox gather in clans, but these are split following one of two rival ideologies. The Snow Speakers, who believe the Divine speaks to them through the falling snow, and the Ice Speakers, who instead look to the ice growing up from the cold earth. The Frozen Fists are the elite fighters of the Ice Speaker clans in their war with the Snow Speakers. They have devoted themselves to the divine strength of the ice 
and are able to encase their huge fists in layers of sharp frost to better pummel their enemies into bloody oblivion. Their communion with the frozen earth also gives them unnatural stamina, allowing them to sow ice and destruction across the battlefield long after most warriors would have given up. Starting into character creation now with our lineage, we are on Algox, which makes us custom lineage. The Algox are similar to the Inox, only bigger and more furry. And of course, nothing like them really exists in D&D, besides maybe like a Yeti. But we can't really be a Yeti, but we can be custom lineage. We're going to choose to be size medium and not small, since we want to be as big as possible physically as the Frozen Fist. We're going to take Dark Vision over the skill, because it's probably going to be more useful for us, and it kind of makes more sense with the concept of the character. And then finally, we'll gain a free feat and a plus two to one ability score of our choice. For our free feat, we're going to want either A, Gift of the Chromatic Dragon, or B, Magic Initiate. Gift of the Chromatic Dragon, I would say you would want to take if and only if your DM will let you do something that isn't available rules as written. See, Gift of the Chromatic Dragon has two parts, but part of the Gift of the Chromatic Dragon allows us to use Chromatic Infusion. It says that as a bonus action, we can imbue a simple or martial melee weapon that we are holding with an elemental damage type. Acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison are all viable. And for one minute, our attacks with that weapon will deal an extra D4 of the elemental type that we selected. If your DM allows you to use this feature on your unarmed strikes and allows it to apply to your fists, then definitely take this because this is one of the easiest ways to become a frozen fist and get cold damage on your punches right away at level one. Realistically though, it has to be a simple or martial melee weapon, which rules as written is not our own fists and therefore would not work rules as written. So that's why I say magic initiate. Magic Initiate, we would want to take instead, and I'll assume that we do, just for the sake of keeping the build more or less viable. And with Magic Initiate, we can pick a first level spell and a cantrip from any class's spell list to permanently learn. We can then cast that spell once per day for free, without any spell slots. If we have the spell's known feature, then we actually can still use spell slots because we know the spell. This is going to be important for later. But just know that for right now, we would want to go to the Bard spell list and pick up Healing Word as our spell. And then probably Thunderclap for the cantrip, since apparently Thunderclap is a Bard cantrip. Healing Word right away from the Bard subclass is going to allow us to get a little bit of health regeneration, given that we'd want to be selfish with it and cast it as a bonus action on ourselves. Looking at our stats now, we're going to be spread a little thin, but not as thin as we possibly could be. Looking at our stats, after point by, we're going to want the following set of ability scores. We're going to want 16 strength, putting 7 points into it and then getting our plus 2 from custom lineage. We're going to want 10 dexterity, just putting 2 points into that. We're going to put 7 points into constitution to give us 14 constitution. We're going to leave intelligence alone and it's going to stay at 8, putting no points into it. We're then going to put 4 points into wisdom, getting us up to 12 wisdom. And we're going to put 7 points into Charisma, getting us to 14 Charisma. For our background, there is actually a specific background that fits us perfectly. However, your DM may veto it. If they do, that's really too bad, because this is kind of perfect for our theme, as well as our mechanical scaling for our character. But there's not much we can do if they really say no. And if they do, pick any background you want. For us, though, I'm going to say that we're going to take the Giant's Foundling background. Given that we are a large northern beast of a lineage, I think it makes sense that we are a giant's foundling. Mechanically, giant's foundling gives us access to the strike of the giant's feet right away at level one. And the strike of the giants allows us to pick one type of giant to be descended from and then gain an extra bonus on our melee weapon attack based on the type of giant we picked. The Algox are definitely the closest thing to a frost giant. And frost giant gives us frost strike which legitimately turns us into the Frozen Fist. The Frost Strike feature says that whenever we hit a target with a melee weapon attack or a ranged weapon attack using a thrown weapon, we can spend one use of this feature, which we have a number equal to our proficiency bonus, and then it'll do the following. The target will take an extra 1d6 cold damage, that's why we're the Frozen Fist, 
and if the target is a creature, it must succeed on a constitution saving throw or have its speed reduced to zero until the start of our next turn. Right away, that is just a great feature, and we really want to have this as quickly as possible. If we're not able to get it right away from our background, then we might even want to take it with our custom lineage free feat, or pick it up later in the build. And if your DM vetoes it as a whole, then really, it might be hard to even build this character in the first place, and that's just kind of no fun. So hopefully you can get it as it's perfect, both mechanically and thematically, for our Frozen Fist. Starting up the build now at level 1, we're going to start off as a fighter. We're going to get Second Wind, which is another bonus action self-heal for a little bit more regeneration. And we're also going to gain a fighting style of our choice, of which we are going to take Unarmed Fighting. Unarmed Fighting makes our Unarmed Strikes just go up to a d6 or a d8 if we're only using our fists and don't have anything else in our hands, including a shield or other weapon. If you just want to hit hard with a d8 for your damage die, just go with your fists. If you want to be a little more defensive, pick up a shield and still use a d6 with your main fist that you can coat in ice. At level 2, we are immediately jumping over to Sorcerer. Sorcerer is going to get us the main combo that we're using for this build, at least for the first little while, and it also fits with how we're getting two different playstyles. Right away when we pick up Sorcerer, we're going to want to pick the giant soul sorcerer from Unearthed Arcana. Again, this is kind of perfect because it gets us what we want mechanically, and it fits with the whole frost giant, big frost creature, yeti, algox theme. If you don't like Unearthed Arcana or your DM is against that as well, there are a couple other ways to get what we really want, which is the Armor of Agathys spell. Namely, if you still wanted to be a sorcerer, pick up Clockwork Soul. Clockwork Soul can gain access to it an expanded spell list from the Abjuration spell list, meaning that we can switch out the spell that we're told we get, and we could instead pick up the Armor of Agathys spell. This basically helps us stay on par with what our build is going to do, and it helps with our scaling. Option two though, which I'm not gonna talk about, but honestly does feel like a really good option thematically as well, is Celestial Warlock. Celestial Warlock allows us to pick up Armor of Agathys because it is a Warlock spell, but it also gives us Celestial Light, which is a bonus action healing feature, and that could act as more regenerate for us to spend on ourselves and be selfish with, but it'll allow us to feel like we are constantly regenerating in combat, and that's also very cool. Thematically, both those backup options don't really have other features that gel really well with the theme of our character class, but you could realistically re-theme them to make more sense. Giant Soul, though, is just perfect for both mechanics and theme, so I'm going to assume that we have access to that for the sake of the build. When we choose Giant Soul as our Sorcerer subclass, we gain Jotun Resilience, which says that we gain an extra hit point right away, and we gain an extra hit point each time we take a level in this Sorcerer class. We also gain the Mark of Ordning, which gives us access to two first level spells and an extra spell at third level. The first level spells we get are what we really care about because that gives us Armor of Agathys and the Ray of Frost cantrip. We're not too worried about Ray of Frost as a cantrip, though it is nice to have a ranged attack in our back pocket. And Armor of Agathys is the main thing that we're going to be building around in a few levels or so. Admittedly, if you saw my Frost Demon build from way back, this character is going to be similar to them, just we're replacing Barbarian levels with a few different tricks. And one of those tricks is the Blade Wormed Cantrip, actually. We don't really have the combo ready to go yet, but essentially pairing Blade Ward with Armor of Agathys means that we'll be able to effectively double the amount of temporary hit points we get from the Armor of Agathys spell without the cost of having to go Barbarian. And of course, it also will only double if we're going up against enemies that deal piercing, bludgeoning, or slashing damage. At level 3, we are going to go up to Sorcerer 2, and we now gain Font of Magic. Not only can we punch and have the ability to sometime punch with a frozen fist, but we also have our spells to also use in combat, and with Font of Magic we now have sorcery points, so we can spend those to get a few more spells, getting a little bit more longevity out of our powerful cold damage abilities. Being able to cast Armor of Agathys is really nice, because Armor of Agathys is quite literally, at least in my mind, a shield and retaliate card. Reduces the damage you take, and lets you deal damage back. At level 4, we're going to go up to Sorcerer 3, and here we gain Metamagic. 
Meta Magic allows us to pick up the Quicken spell Meta Magic, as well as one other Meta Magic choice that can really be your favorite. We're not too worried about it for the build, so pick whatever Meta Magic option you really like besides Quicken spell. With Quicken spell, we now gain access to our full combo, so it's time to talk about that. What we can do is we can walk up to an enemy on our turn. We can use our bonus action to quicken spell, cast Armor of Agathys on ourselves, and then use our action to cast Blade Ward. This will give us the resistance that we want, as well as allow us to have temporary hit points and deal some retaliate damage if we get hit. Because we're already next to an enemy, hopefully, that means that the enemy now has to make a choice. They can hit us, potentially not doing that much damage, and they will actually just take some cold damage automatically as retaliate damage. If they choose not to though, then they'll probably want to move away from us, which would trigger an opportunity attack unless they can disengage. If they do trigger an opportunity attack, here's where we get pretty tricky. We can obviously still punch them with our unarmed strike as a reaction op as a re opportunity attack reaction, which is awesome. But Strike of the Giants also works once per turn, not once on our turn meaning that not only can we still punch them with cold damage, as a frozen fist should, but we can also make them trigger the constitution saving throw. And if they happen to fail that, their speed gets set to zero until our next turn, meaning that all of a sudden we have a mini sentinel. Obviously the sentinel feat is better because it doesn't require the constitution saving throw, but given that we picked Strike of the Giants for the frost damage for our frozen fist, and the extra freezing effect is more of a bonus on top, that's really cool, pun intended. And the nice thing about this is that we can just continuously do this over and over again. Obviously, as long as we have Armor of Agathys and the temporary hit points still up, we don't want to cast it again, but we can continuously cast Blade Ward. Or if we feel like enemies just aren't going to attack us, we can choose to go on the offensive on our turn and instead attack hopefully dealing damage to put down an enemy, or at least hurt them a little bit, then making them feel like they are okay to attack us, but they'll still suffer some of the retaliate damage from our Armor of Agathy spell. At level 5, we're actually now going to jump back to Fighter and pick up Action Surge at Fighter 2. Action Surge doesn't help us too much right now, but it does let us do two actions in a single turn, which can be really, really great in certain circumstances. And technically, if we wanted a really big turn, we could do our combo of bonus action Quicken Spell Armor of Agathys, use an action to cast the Cantrip Blade Ward to defend ourselves, and then either hit an enemy if there's only one in front of us, or if there's multiple, we can cast Thunderclap. Thunderclap was a cantrip that we picked up from the Bard spell list, thanks to Magic Initiate, and it is a melee AoE cantrip. It deals a d6 thunder damage to every creature that's within 5 feet of us, assuming they fail a constitution saving throw. Maybe not the most reliable saving throw, but certainly great for area of effect damage when we're trying to get in front of a bunch of enemies and just get in their way as a big, tanky Frozen Fist. At level 6, we are now Fighter 3. Fighter 3 lets us pick our subclass, and for our subclass we are going with the Rune Knight. Rune Knight gets us more giant theme, which we've been flavoring as Algox theme this entire time pretty much, and that just makes sense for our entire build. As a Rune Knight, we gain access to the Rune Carver feature, where we can inscribe two runes onto our armor, weapons, whatever we're really wearing or holding, and then those runes will give us a passive bonus, as well as a bonus that we can activate once per short or long rest. For the runes that we get right now, it's pretty much up to you what you'd actually like. I would go with the frost rune for sure, and then either the cloud rune or the stone rune, just because those thematically make the most sense. The fire rune is kind of opposed to what we want to do as a frozen fist. We also gain the giant's might feature. The giant's might feature is another bonus action feature that we can activate that allows us to become size large. And that is exactly what we want as the frozen fist because we are supposed to be a big beefy character. Then, while we're size large, we do an extra 1d6 damage once on each of our turns, which is also really awesome if we're actually going to attack on our turns, which eventually, yes, we will. We can also use this feature a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus as well, which is really awesome too. At level 7, we are now a Fighter 4, and we gain our first ability score improvement slash feat. It is about time, but admittedly, it's not going to be great for scaling just yet. We're going to pick up the feat Fury of the Frost Giant. This is another Bigby's Glory of Giants feats, 
And so if you weren't able to get Giant's Foundling and strike the Giants because you didn't want it or your DM said no, then honestly, we probably won't be picking up this feat either, in which case I would just increase your strength by plus two. But with this feat, it's still a half feat, so we can increase our strength by plus one, or you could do constitution or wisdom if you wanted to do that instead. I said strength because that's what we use to attack, and that's also what our Frost Giant Strike of the Giants feature is based off of. We can use strength for that save DC as well, which is really cool. We also gain resistance to cold damage, which just makes sense for our Algox character. I don't think there's any way we could really get away with calling ourselves a full Algox and a Frozen Fist if we weren't resistant to cold damage. We also gain Frigid Retaliation, which is just another Retaliate ability that deals cold damage, which is perfect for us. It says that immediately after a creature within 30 feet of us, not just next to us, but 30 feet, hits us with an attack roll and deals damage, we can use our reaction to retaliate with a Conjured Blast of Ice. That creature must make a constitution saving throw, again, fairly unreliable, but on a failed save, they'll take cold damage equal to 1d8 plus our proficiency bonus, and their speed will be reduced to zero until the end of its next turn. Honestly, the reaction itself is neat, but not really mechanically powerful. However, it will come in handy for any time that we get hit by a ranged attack and we don't have someone we want to opportunity attack with our fist, or if we run out of uses of our Strike of the Giants feature when we do opportunity attack with our fist, we could exchange that with this retaliate feature instead. At level 8, we become a Fighter 5, and now we have extra attack. It's now the point in time where our combo is starting to teeter off a little bit. Even though we had second level spells at level 9, we're going to jump back to Sorcerer 4, and at Sorcerer 4, we gain another ability score improvement slash feat, as well as a third second level spell slot, which is really awesome. For the feat, I would recommend rounding off your strength to 18 and improving your constitution by 1 to 15. At level 10, we're going to immediately hop back to Fighter 6 to pick up yet another ability score improvement slash feat. This time, we're going to take the Crusher feat, because the Crusher feat lets us improve our constitution by plus 1. Also with the Crusher feat, Whenever we crit and deal bludgeoning damage, we have a little extra bonus to throw on top of that attack. And once per turn, when we do attack with bludgeoning damage, we can push an enemy five feet, just casually, no save required. And that's also pretty nice since it gives us a little tiny bit of battlefield control. Where this gets really funny is in very niche situations where we are still trying to use our combo, or at least some of it. Let's say we did use Blade Ward and we cast Armor of Agathys on ourselves, and so an enemy now has to make a choice. They can either attack us or they can try to run away. Assuming they do try to run away, we can then opportunity attack them and use our Strike of the Giants feature. Said Strike of the Giants is once per turn, and when we hit with it, we'll deal bludgeoning damage as well as cold damage. Assuming they fail the constitution saving throw, which could be rare, but it could happen, their speed is going to be dropped to zero. And then, because Crusher also works once per turn, not once on our turn, that means that we can also push them five feet away. This means that that creature, who tried to leave and not attack us, assuming they didn't disengage, is now stuck with a speed of zero and no way to actually attack us. That's just an awesome way to completely cancel out an enemy's turn in a very niche situation, admittedly. But still, if it happened, it would be pretty funny. Level 11, we are Sorcerer 5. And at Sorcerer 5, we gain third level spell slots. You can pick any sort of sorcerer spells that you would like. We really like just being able to cast Armor of Agathys at third level. At level 12, we are Sorcerer 6, and here we gain the Soul of Lost Astoria feature from the Giant Soul Sorcerer. Soul of Lost Astoria says that based on the type of giant that we picked originally when we took the subclass, which of course was Frost Giant, we gain a bonus based on that giant. Immediately after we cast any of our Mark of Ordening spells, we gain temporary hit points equal to our Constitution modifier. But if that spell is Armor of Agathys, we instead increase the amount of temporary hit points we get by an amount equal to our constitution modifier again. Level 13, we are up to fighter 7 now as we jump back to fighter. First things first, we have unlocked a third rune that we can get, and we've also unlocked the ability to choose the hill rune. The hill rune is definitely what we want, since when it's on our person just passively, we now have resistance to poison damage. 
and when we choose to activate the Hill Rune, we gain resistance to piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage for one full minute. That is really great, and it means we no longer have to try and figure out when to cast Blade Ward, because we could use our action for Armor of Agathes, bonus action for the Hill Rune, and then just go nuts in one big combat, having flat resistance for a full minute. We also gain Runic Shield. Runic Shield is another reaction feature we can use that just says whenever another creature that we can see within 60 feet of us is hit by an attack, we can force that attack to get re-rolled. We can use it a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus, but I doubt we ever fully will, given that we're probably going to want to use our reaction for opportunity attacks or maybe our frigid retaliation feature. But assuming there are no enemies nearby us to actually use those features with, we could protect our allies by having attacks get re-rolled against them. At level 14, we are now Fighter 8, and here we get another ability score improvement slash feat, and I'm going to say that we're just taking tough. It may mechanically be better to actually just improve our constitution by plus 2, because we still get hit points, and we also gain extra bonuses to Armor of Agathes, as well as other giant soul spells that we got. At level 15, we are Fighter 9, and we now gain Indomitable. Indomitable is an okay feature, but it's not really the greatest given that we are a fairly specialized character. However, on the off chance that we do do fail saving throw and rerolling it might help, we certainly could. At level 16, we are Fighter 10, and here we gain another Rune Knight feature. The feature we get is Great Stature. Great Stature says that when we gain this feature, we roll 3d4, and we grow a number of inches in height equal to the roll. That's perfect for feeling like a giant character, because even though it really doesn't do anything mechanically powerful, it just makes us larger than what we would normally be, so we feel more imposing. Plus, an actual mechanical benefit we do get from Great Stature is that the extra damage of Giant's Might is now a d8. Level 17, we're now Fighter 11, and we have extra attack times 2. We can now punch 3 times on our turn, and that's really awesome for being a Frozen Fist, though we actually don't really have that much ice to back up that many attacks throughout a full combat with. So maybe be a little sparing in how often you actually punch your enemies with a full fist of ice. Level 18, we're a fighter 12, we gain our second last ability score improvement slash feat, and here is a good time to either cap off our strength at 20, or increase our constitution to 18 if we didn't when we picked up tough, or a third option, and this is really crazy, is increase our charisma. Our charisma has been sitting at 14, so a lot of the spells haven't actually been too reliable. And luckily, some of the features that we actually want to use, we've been able to use other ability scores for the save DCs instead of charisma. I would assume we just cap our strength for right now, but you can pick anything that you'd like. At level 19, we are a fighter 13, and here we gain Indomitable times 2, so we can use it twice before we have no uses of it left. And that's again not terrible, but it's nothing super special. Finally at level 20, we are fighter 14, and we are going to round off the build with a last ability score improvement slash feat. Here, I'm going to say we increase our constitution by plus two, but the same things go from when we're at level 18. All right, time to summarize our build. Well, we certainly do have a frozen fist, at least some of the time. Our Strike of the Frost Giant is the backbone to our main attacks. If we don't have any uses left, we're just kind of punching, and that kind of loses some of the theme of the Frozen Fist. But to be fair, the Frozen Fist isn't always about punching with ice. We have plenty of retaliate damage through Armor of Agathes, as well as Fury of the Frost Giant, and the um, Armor of Agathes Plus version, thanks to Soul of Lost Astoria, is even better, especially when paired with the Hill Rune from Rune Knight. We have lots of damage reduction, slash shields in Frosthaven terms, thanks to Blade Ward and eventually the Hill Rune again, once we get it unlocked. I didn't talk about them too much, but we have some other Frosthaven conditions, like Immobilize, given that we have two features that can potentially set an enemy's speed to zero. If we picked up Sentinel at some point in time, that would make it three, but realistically the two is probably fine. Besides that though, we are a big frontline bodyguard who wants nothing more than to get attacked and dish out some good retaliate damage as well as battlefield control with our own frozen fists. Let me know what you thought of the build or what you would change to get closer to the theme of the Frosthaven character class or just how you would build a really big yeti tank character in D&D. 
Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me, and I hope to see you in the next one.